whether it's nature or whether it's a kid that's fascinated with you know poetry or something i don't know like we all have these little doorways that are open when we when we're kids mm. that we close for some reason and uh what often takes a place in my work with people is like how do we open those doors again Welcome to the 1000 Day Sober Podcast. My name is Lee Davy. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol. I am an amazing father, husband, son, friend, leader, lover, and master coach. And I spend every minute of every day helping people to live a self-led life after alcohol. After alcohol. And welcome to March. It's Relationship Month. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you something. I've been thinking long and hard about how I can provide more and more value, what my position is on this planet when it comes to helping people, because I've been doing this for donkey's years now, like a decade. I stopped drinking over 11 years ago, and pretty soon, right within the first month of me stopping, I wanted to help people. So I've been thinking about it. I've been doing this a long time, and uh, I want to, if I'm being honest with you, I think I should have reached more people by now, right? So I've been saying to myself, what's going on, Lee? Where do you see yourself sitting in this space? And honestly, I get, I, I really understood recently um, that there was a time when I thought that becoming someone that doesn't drink alcohol was the end of an epic journey. Like, I'd done it. Right? Or if I help somebody to become someone that doesn't drink alcohol, they've done it. Celebrations, blow the kazoos, let off the paper streamers. We don't drink alcohol anymore. We're done. The end of an epic journey. But I realize, especially because in 2021, me and my wife Liza sat down and had some serious conversations about ending our marriage, right? Why? Because we were unhappy. Why? Well, one of the big reasons my wife was unhappy is because of my inability to show up consistently in what I call self-energy, in my pure essence, what I'm the man that I'm capable of being. Why was I unhappy in our relationship? For the very same reason. Because I was showing up consistently in my ego, my child. Imagine being married to a child. It's not nice. It's not cute. It's not cuddly. Imagine being a child. It's not good. Not when you get to 47 years of age, right? So I now realize that actually I got it wrong for so many years. Becoming someone that doesn't drink alcohol isn't the end of an epic journey. It's just the start of an epic journey because now we don't drink suddenly the one of the first thing that happens is we start to feel. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we start to feel because alcohol is a numbing agent and we're not drinking it anymore. So suddenly we start to feel. And if you join a group like Strive, you also start to think because you are surrounded by people who are thinking and who are talking and communicating about how they're feeling and thinking in life, about the, what they want to achieve, about the conundrums of life, the human condition, and suddenly you're getting involved in that. That, to me, is the work. There is a space here for people like me to create families like Strive that appeals to people who have stopped drinking. People who have stopped drinking alcohol and are suddenly thinking, well, this isn't like what I thought it would be. <laughs> Where's all the unicorns and rainbows gone? Someone shot them all and uh, blacked them all out of the sky. Because when you stop drinking alcohol, whilst that is wonderful and amazing and all the stuff that goes with it, it's very likely you're still surrounded by a load of people who still drink. You're still surrounded by people who share the same bed as you who drink. You've still got the same wounds. You've still got the same trauma. You've still got the same things in life that you're not happy about. And you might not have developed the skills and the courage and the confidence and the compassion needed to navigate your way through these minefields, right? Just quitting alcohol doesn't allow you to do that. If it did, my second wife wouldn't be uh, seriously contemplating divorce, right? Because I don't drink and neither does she much, right? So, Strive's all about 
helping you to experience a self-led life after alcohol, to be in your self-energy, your essence, to show up as your creative genius as often as you can, to be above the line in a state of curiosity, consciousness, and compassion, and to steer away from victim consciousness in that alcohol drama triangle that I talk about in my book of the villain, the victim, or hero, okay? So that's what we're all about. So what I'm doing is for the next 12 months, we're going to be theme orientated. So in March, it's all about relationships, relationships with ourself, relationships with those that we love, and relationships with the unknown, relationships with nature, relationships with God, relationships with spirituality. And we're going to be talking about that today with Darren Silver, but more about him later on, right? So what does Relationship Month mean? Well, we're going to have a series of guests this month on the podcast who are going to talk about relationships. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about Darren Silver, and we're going to talk about your relationship with nature. Uh, We're going to talk to Kathleen Hendricks, the wife of Gay Hendricks, and we're going to talk about how to create conscious relationships that stand the test of time. Kathleen and Gay have been married for 200 years, and they still love each other and have a vibrant sex life and all that kind of stuff. I want to learn about that and understand why and spread that gospel to you folks. We're going to be talking to a guest that's been on here before, Lisa Dinhofer. She is a thanatologist. For those of you that don't know what a thanatologist, and you're going to thank me if it comes up in the pub quiz on Sunday night, if you still go to the pub drinking your sparkling water, a thanatologist is a grief expert. I'm going to be talking to Lisa about the grief of divorce, blended family, and also the horrific thought of losing someone while you're in a relationship with them, how do you get over that without turning into alcohol? I'm going to talk to Lisa about those things. And we're going to be inviting Krishna Marateur into Strive uh, to do a special um, talk with the Strivers on finding your ikigai. If you don't know what ikigai is, it's the Japanese word for meaning and purpose, right? So all that is coming uh, your way. You will hear Kathleen. You'll hear Darren, you'll hear Lisa. We'll have one more guest on as well talking about relationships this month. If you want to be in the crowd when Krishna's talking about the icky guy, you need to join Stripe. And if you do join Stripe this month, this is what else you'll be getting. Every Monday, I will be live on Zoom teaching you and guiding you through a concept that really worked well in my relationship with Liza um, on Zoom. Week one, we're going to be uh, talking about the self, self self-energy, self-essence, and why it's so important in relationships. Week two, we're going to be talking about projection, okay? When we are judging, we're really angry because this person judges me. It's very likely because you're judging them, right? We're going to talk about projection. And week three, we're going to talk about attachment styles and personality types and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Looking at the work of uh, Bowlby and uh, previous guest Don. Yeah, Stephen. I don't know. I've forgotten his name. Bloody hell. A couple of episodes ago. Um, And we are going to be talking about communication. We're going to be talking about Stephen Kessler. That's it. We're going to be talking about communication, nonviolent communication, especially the work of Marshall Rosenberg. So that's every Monday in the month of May. I'm going to be there for an hour. If you can't make it, don't worry. We'll record it and you get a look at the recording. Then every Friday, I'm going to be there for an hour again. Um, And in week one, when we do self, I will be there on the Friday to do hot seat coaching and answer any questions there is on self to have a more immersive, uh, participatory um, environment where we can practice stuff. So in the communication week, for example, we'll all be able to get on Zoom and practice nonviolent communication. As uncomfortable as it may feel, it's really, really important that we practice this stuff, right? So that is coming your way if you want to join Strive in March, all right? And you can always quit after March if you don't if you don't want to continue. And if you think it's a pile of pants, I'll give you your money back as well. Uh, what else have we got to offer in March? Well, Michael and Stella, two of our senior Strive members, that means they're both very old. Uh, they're going to be doing weekly Zoom calls every Wednesday and every Thursday. And you're also going to be able to get into our family uh, on Marco Polo. And we've just started to 
um, emigrate, well, not emigrate, but add as a complementary platform, Discord. So we're on Discord as well, where we can talk about relationships all month long. And last but not least, we are introducing a new philosophy of mine called Heal to Earn. Uh, we're just starting out. We don't know where it's going to go, but we've got really high hopes for it. I'm really excited. So we're going to be doing a lot of quests in March. Uh, what are these quests? Well, they could be something as simple as um, make sure that you tell your wife something really vulnerable today about your sex life. It could be something like get together with another member of Strive and practice nonviolent communication for an hour. Uh, there will be a wide range of quests that you'll be able to participate in. And you will be able to earn Strive coins. So Strive coins will be our digital coin here at Strive. And uh, each Strive coin at the moment is pegged as one US dollar. And you'll be able to use that money to reduce your subscription fees, uh, to have coaching with myself and other Strive coaches, to buy uh, training courses that we create that are not part of the subscription service. And who knows, one day outside of Strive, you may be able to spend them in Sainsbury's on a melon or a jar of pickles, right? So if you want to join us, March, we're talking about race ships. April is going to be codependency. We're going to cover topics like sex. We're going to cover topics like parenting. We're going to cover money. We're going to cover addiction, obviously. Okay. We're going to cover fun, all that kind of stuff, meaning and purpose. So Strive is the place to be if you want to live a self-led life after alcohol, all right? What else have I got to talk to you about before I pass you on to Darren? Well, I caught COVID. Uh, I caught COVID and uh, today I did a test and I'm negative. <coughs> Every time I say I got COVID, I cough. Um, there you are. That's, uh, there's something going on there, isn't there? So I caught COVID um, and something else has happened that I want to draw your attention to. You, you obviously are all aware now that Russia has invaded the Ukraine. Uh, what you won't be aware is uh, the guy who is responsible for making this podcast a really beautiful audio experience for you. So the sound engineer that knits everything together, um, makes the sound pucker, puts the intro and all that. His name is Stan. Um, and Stan is a family man who lives in Ukraine. OK, um, he has had to move out the city, move his family into the country. And it's a very, very scary time for him. If you've been reading the news, you'll know uh, that the country has been handing out Kalashnikovs to uh, local residents to take up arms and protect their families. And, uh, you know, Stan, who I've been working with for many years and I love dearly, he's in the middle of that. Right. He's in the middle of that. So. If you want to donate some money to Stan to help him out while he's going through this terrible time, then uh, drop me a note at the strive method at gmail.com and we'll make that happen. If you just want to send him a love note, send it to me at the strive method at gmail.com and we'll make that happen. OK, um, yeah, unsung hero. I love him and I'm just praying uh, that he gets through this whole um, sorry affair. Um, Minimal, minimal um, injury or impact on his life, right? Because it's a very, very difficult time. And this whole COVID, Russia, Ukraine thing, it's really testing time. You know, my philosophy um, here at uh, Strive is there are no bad parts following on from Richard Schwartz and internal family systems that there is intrinsically within every single one of us parts of us that behaves in ways that we could find abhorrent, um, but they're doing so in order to keep us safe. And that's been really challenging when you've got someone like Vladimir Putin, who is just doing something that we all look at and we think, wow, what the fuck, right? Like, how, how, how is this even possible that this could happen in this day and age? And, and similarly, when, you know, with COVID, the vaccine, non-vaccine, debate and argument that I I feel, I feel and I hear when I'm on a train in the UK, such a hot, hot topic, right? And it's allowed me to really go inside of myself and to really test some of these uh, theories and philosophies that I've been picking up from the likes of Richard Schwartz and that I've been promoting through Strive, right? Um, and that is curiosity and that is compassion. 
and that is um, an open mind, right? So I've been really thinking to myself, what the hell is going on in a man like Vladimir Putin's mind right now? What the hell is going on uh, in the minds of the, the Russian people going to war? What's going in the minds of the Russian people? What goes through the mind of somebody who is really anti-vax? What goes through the mind of someone who is pro-vax? And trying to do it from a place free of too much judgment, okay? And trying to find some resemblance of compassion because I really believe that if we want to live a self-led life beyond alcohol, compassion is the key. Is making it a practice to always come from a place of compassion. And my challenge to you is to do the same thing, okay? We are easily biased and easily swayed um, by people, our environments, okay? Just be aware of that and be above the line uh, when it comes to where we land on various different topics. Anyway, on to today's guest, Darren Silver. MA is a rite of passage guide a nature-connected coach, ceremonialist, can't believe I said that without messing it up, and innovative educator. He has over a decade of experience working with ritual, wilderness, living skills, and guiding transformational experiences residentially and internationally. He is a gifted storyteller and apprentice to the old myths. Darren weaves the power of the natural world, vision, and community in devotion to the remembrance of regenerative culture. I first came across Darren when I was on a course called The Illuminated Man. Thank you to Nikhil, Nikhil, Nikhil Kale uh, for running that. And I thought, holy shit, what a super powerful man this guy is, right? And I had to get him on the show because when it comes to relationships, we can easily forget that relationship with nature, the relationship with the earth. You know, Look what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, in Ukraine, right? We're, we're not just bombing people. We're bombing the shit out of the earth, right? Like um, what's happening in Australia right now with all the floods and everything that's going on? It's like Mother Earth is giving us a message. And I think it's really important, especially around your triggers, for example, that you can build into your trigger toolkit your relationship with nature, and to increase and uh, celebrate that, I think is really important. So without further ado, I'm going to shut the hell up. I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Darren Silver. And if you want to know more about this lovely fella, then email me at thestridemethod at gmail.com. Okay, really appreciate you. Please, 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 if you appreciate me, can you go to your local podcast player and rate and review the show. If you think it's shit, uh, don't do that. Just ignore me. All right. See you later, folks. So, Darren, I, I'm coming off the back of COVID. I I tested this morning and I'm now negative, but I've still got a little bit of a cough. So mm. Mm. you might you might hear me coughing if I talk too much, which usually happens to talking too much bit. <laughs> um, I Glad you're heard you. Better. Yeah, thank you. I heard you speaking at Illuminated Man uh, that mm. Nikhil um, organized. And I think there was um, four or five speakers on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I can, I can give you feedback now that you definitely made the biggest impact on the group, for sure. And when, when we were talking afterwards, your, your presence and your information and your knowledge and experience, it was it was. Mm -hmm. Or inspiring. That's why I reached out to you because my community strive where I help people to quit alcohol and live a uh, self-led life. We're having relationships month this month. Mm. And I was thinking of what I was learning from you about one's relationship with nature, one's relationship with spirituality or whatever the unknown is, our relationship to ourself. I thought, what better man to speak to about things like that than Darren, you know? <laughs> so the first question I want to ask you that I wrote down actually during the illuminated man was given what I've said, how does one participate in life? I know it's like a, a big question, but what's your thoughts when I say that to you? How, how do we participate? How do, yeah. how do, how do I participate in life? That's a huge question. I mean, that is the foundation of, 
a true rite of passage or initiation is that it it brings us into deeper participation with life. Ultimately, that's that's the biggest purpose of a rite of passage or initiation. Um, what often happens today in modern rites of passage and initiatory experiences um, is we spend a lot of time realizing what we're not that stands in the way of our full participation. I mean, a lot of my community happens to be sober addicts, myself included, (laughs) you know, Mm. Um, and addiction never really brought me down, but I have that component in my, in my, it's part of my disposition, if you will. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a certain uh, rapture for life that a lot of my community and myself desires. And I think a lot of people in the world, and we don't have clear channels of which to bring that intensity to life. Um, uh, I think, I mean, I'm making an assumption that a lot of people listening to this are interested in or experienced levels of addiction. Um, Addiction to some degree is like the ways that we can put things between us and life. Mm. That we have to have that um, in between us and life so that we can interact with life. (laughs) It's like a mediator, Um, Mm. often to our own demise and destruction. And so to have clear ways of which we can participate yeah, um, that still has that level of intensity. It still has that level of passion, um, of deep feeling. Yeah. So first thoughts. First thoughts. Thank you for that. Um, it reminds me of what I now call our kind of four path fake fur <laughs> ritualization and initiation <laughs> as a man. Like when I grew up, my, my big rite of passage as a man was you will drink as much alcohol as you can, including all of these shots on this bar. You will put yourself on the very edge of being admitted to hospital uh, with alcoholic poison. You will put yourself on the very edge of falling asleep tonight and maybe dying on your own vomit because that is a ritualization that you need to go through to be boy to man. And even my father mm-hmm. who showed no love towards me his entire life, God bless his soul. Well, God bless his soul. He's still alive, but it's not his fault. Like he didn't know how to love. It's not that he didn't love. He didn't know how to love. Right. Mm-hmm. Even him, he just looked at me and it wasn't until I turned 18 when I could go to the pub officially with him that he that I existed, that he was able to bond with me. And and I remember looking at him, I'd be in the pub with him. He wouldn't even speak to me. And I was so proud that all mm. of a sudden my father was showing an interest in me and expressing love. And that initiation as a young man is just one of many, right? Drugs is there, sex and control, pornography, it's all there. But for me, the big one was alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that one decision, that one initiation as a young male to be told that the way to be a man is to get off your tits, is to use that alcohol in a way to abuse women, abuse yourself, Mm -hmm. abuse your your culture and your environment that you grew up in, your mom, your dad, your sisters, anybody. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm still dealing with today as a 47-year-old. Mm. Yesterday, by the way, I had to Google how old I was. <laughs> I've been telling everyone I'm 48. I had to Google yesterday and I realized, I'm 47. What the fuck, man? <laughs> oh, so, yeah. That that's that's what I thought of when you said about participating in life. I I hear you. I, I don't think I I don't think I've ever fully participated in life. Even getting sober, I still don't think that I'm fully participating in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have to remember we have choice. Um, because 
today to fully participate, especially for young people, especially for teenagers. Um, they look at the world and they don't want anything to do with it. They look up to, you know, elders or olders or mom and dad. And they're like, I don't want to live. I don't want to live like that. Um, now my partner has a, has a 17 year old. Um, so I spent a lot of time with, with a teenager and we were watching, um, don't look up. Mm, I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. And like the first 15 or 20 minutes or somewhere in the beginning of the film, um, uh, her son was like, well, I can't do this. It's too overwhelming to watch this. It's too overwhelming. And, you know, there's been lots of times uh, in time in with him in the last four years that I've felt that sense of over, overwhelm in him of what's happening in the world. Um, what kept him in the film was the humor. Yeah. That kept him there. It kept him able to watch because he was so overwhelmed. So it's, it, there, there's, um, we have to remember we have choice of what we want to see, of what we want to participate in. You know, and these days it's like, you have to, you have to develop those strong relationships. For me, that's been connecting to nature. That has given me some sense of robust threads of relationship um, of which then I can go into the world and have more awareness of myself and where I want to participate, how I want to participate. Mm. On that, one of the things you one of the things you said in the Illuminated Manor, I I wrote down. <laughs> it was this the sit spot. Yeah, yeah. He was talking about the sit spot, and I wrote down something in the realms of "Holy shit, got to do this!" And I've got to add this into the trigger toolkit for the community. Like, what a beautiful mm. thing! And then I mm. never did it. And I want to talk uh. about. And I want to talk about why I never did it and why I continue to not do it. Uh, and and um, and this will help me understand why I'm not fully participating in life and help other people listening to it is it's almost like um, there's a competition for my time, right? So like when I'm figuring out what it is I need to do today or tomorrow or next week or whatever, and I'm pulling it all into my calendar, the sit the sit spot, and you can explain what that is in a minute. The sit spot. It doesn't find a space in my calendar. So it's like there's something in me that still hasn't, or is still incapable of, of releasing to what I feel intuitively is correct. Is it mm. sometimes less is more, sometimes just being still and not talking or doing and just like walking through a park versus sitting down and looking at a tree, right? Like mm. I'm not seemingly able to get it sufficiently enough up my priority list in order for me to do it. So I'm not getting the value of it. Could you just talk about the sit spot and then probably then uh, reflect back on what your thoughts are and what I just said there? Yeah. So the sit spot is a, is a practice of going out in nature to a particular place. Like it's um, a, a, a consistent place where one is able to let it all go, let the burdens, let the schedule, let the, the speed at which we move to, to let it go and drop into the heartbeat of nature, into the rhythm of nature. Um, there's many things that can take place there. I mean, that's, that's the foundation is, is just to observe. And now, at least in the Northern hemisphere, we're approaching spring. It is an amazing time. Because there is a cacophony of bird song that's gonna that can carry us in the mornings through our sit spot. There is so much activity um, from birds establishing their territories and building nests and courting each other to green buds bursting into leaves. I mean, it's just like um, it's a really exciting time. It can be the sit spot can be just observing nature, or it can be a time for prayer. It can be a time for meditation. It can be a time when I was in college that I practiced presentations. 
Mm. And I would literally call in the trees that were at my sit spot where I went to college um, and say, look, like reflect back to me. And trees have this amazing quality of listening and they are supreme bullshit detectors. So I'd be, you know, in the middle of a presentation and, and I would get this feeling coming back from them of, no, no, man, you're, you're full of shit. <laughs> You know, go deeper in yourself, go deeper there. So the sit spot is a, is a place. I mean, so much can happen there. Mm. Um, and it is, it is an incredible practice. Um, and when I, when I talk about it, I like to encourage people to find a spot that's close, that's easy to access um, and make a commitment with themselves that they know that they can achieve. Whether it's once a week for 15 minutes you know, um, or three times a week for a half an hour or, you know, every day, everybody's different, you know, and, and, and moms, dads, you know, work schedule, but to, to have that, and and you can even find it in a city. There are open parks in cities Mm. that you can come and just sit. Um, so that's the practice. Uh, it's called a sit spot. If you're working with kids, it's like your secret spot, your mystery spot. Um, and of course this comes from Tom Brown and the tracker school. Um, and in regards, uh, I think we need to find a need, like what's the need for you that can, that can bring a motivation, um, some, a little bit more language perhaps, or understanding of which you can participate in that experience. So for example, studying bird language is an awesome way to, and reason for going to a sit spot, um, to, to what, what's a male call of a Robin? What's a female call? What's a, what's a call that they make when there is a Cooper's Hawk coming through or a Fox, um, What's a mating call look like? What's a mating couple sound like? You know, um, those are all questions you can go out with. And then all of a sudden you go, oh my God, you're laying in your house and you go, that's a magpie out there. (laughs) Or that's a chickadee. Or that's a nuthatch. And dang, they've been coming every morning and they're building that nest right in front of me. And I've never noticed it. And then all of a sudden you have all these relationships that you're participating in. I mean, one of the hardest things about addiction is we feel alone, we feel alone and lonely. And so to, to find ways where we are actually in relationship for me, again, that's, that's, it has been through community um, big time. And it's been through nature where all of a sudden I am deeply connected to what's happening outside my window. You know, um, so again, it's safe ways to develop relationship that we can participate because nature is always expressing what is a Robin is always going to express itself as a Robin. A cottonwood is always going to express itself as a cottonwood, but we humans, our magnificent, um, dilemma is that we can lie to ourselves all the time. Mm-hmm. And so by immersing ourselves in the constant expression of what is, then who we truly are begins to emerge. And when it begins in nature, we have this incredible foundation. I mean, I can tell so many stories of being in massive corporate campuses in um, Texas, in San Francisco, um, in Detroit, with uh, in, um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, or maybe it's South Carolina in Raleigh, one of the Carolinas where I feel completely out of my element, completely. And doing some training, teaching something there and just walking out just for a minute and connecting with nature and seeing a small, you know, a cardinal come through and go, okay, you're coming with me in here and having that sense of relationship to bring, I mean, there's story after story I could share. So um, it is one of the most powerful practices to be here for me going to the sit spot, to really be here, to be grounded, to have a true reset of the day. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Grounded. I like that word grounded. Really important. Um, when I was young, 
I moved from the city in Manchester in England to Ogmore Vale in South Wales, and I didn't know anybody. And there was this guy who lived on the same street as me. I won't, I won't mention his name because I'm about to talk about something illegal. Hold on, I'm just about to drop myself in it. And uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I was there, and he said, do you want to see my egg collection? I was like, what's that? And he pulls out this huge tray of bird's eggs, which is highly illegal in the UK, right? And he mm. pulled out this massive tray of bird eggs. Mm. I was like, holy shit, are these whole? He's like, oh, man, if they were whole, they'd stink. And cut a long story short, this lad explained to me his, his, his whole hobby of going out into nature, finding nests, taking eggs, and there was rules around when he could and couldn't take eggs, mm-hmm. blow in the eggs, and then putting them in his collection. Now, for everyone listening to this, it's highly illegal, mm-hmm. and you can go to prison for it in the UK, right? Um, but I started doing it as a kid, not, not sure. knowing the full implications of it. <clears throat> and so my mother found my eggs one day, and she <laughs> went crazy. Um, she bought me a bird book, a pair of binoculars and a camera. Yeah. And then I went out and I, I photographed and I, and I watched, but I, I became really highly attuned to finding nests and to Mm. understanding when I saw the bird, why it was moving or not. And today Liza, my wife, when we went on a safari in South Africa, for example, or when we're just walking through the woods, She's always astounded at my ability to pick out these animals. Yeah. But it feels like a lost part of me. It feels like I keep saying to myself, I'll be honest, Lee, why don't you go bird watching? Why don't you, why don't you set yourself a goal to see X amount of birds, which forces you to travel around the world, gives you a reason to go to a place that you would never normally go and look at these animals Mm-hmm. And there's something that's stopping me. There's something that is like, no, that's not who you are, Lee. And there's this kind of little battle between mm-hmm. this rational, logical need to make money, grow a business, and look after my family aspect yeah. in me. And the other as- yeah. aspect of me that is like, just let me fucking go, Lee. Just let me, mm-hmm. let me go. Let me just spend the day to day doing nothing in the woods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's going you know, on there? man, we, we, there are so many people I talk to that when they were kids, they had this experience with the natural world that was full of wonder, full of um, this organic sense of learning and education. I mean, look right here. I got a bird book right on my yeah, desk. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. I was looking up owls because we were seeing them yesterday hanging around here. Mm-hmm. And I mean, when I was a kid, I did that. And I actually, as soon as I hit adolescence, it all dropped. Yes. As soon as I hit adolescence, it was like all of a sudden, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And ornithology is not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You don't don't show girls your egg collection underneath your bed. Yeah. Yeah. What what do you want to do? At least I did then. Now I do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) I I didn't then. And I, and I forgot about it. And, you know, it wasn't till like a return back to, you know, for me, it occurred at 2021. And then, and then again at 27, 28, huge memories came back um, around 27, 28. Um, But when I, when I work with a lot of people, all of us had this sense of natural curiosity where we wanted to learn Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're deeply connected to nature. And so it, it, um, I have to wonder like what, what, uh, what has been lost when our interior childlike innocence and exuberance and participation um, is kind of shelved or doesn't take priority oftentimes is part of our vision. Part of why we came here gets hidden away as well, whether it's nature or whether it's a kid that's fascinated with, um, you know, poetry or something. I don't know. Like we all have these little doorways that are open when we're, when we're kids Mm. that we close for some reason. 
And uh, what often takes a place in my work with people is like, how do we open those doors again? How do we open those doors again? And um, because it comes with wounds and it comes with gifts and it's holy shit. When I was eight years old, this happened. And that was so painful. I had to close the door, you know, um, but the gift, the gift is right there as well. And that's common language in rites of passages. The wound and the gift are inseparable. Um, and to get a little bit more specific, we all have these experiences as children where the, where the door is open. You know, I love hearing, I love hearing this uh, relationship you have with birds um, touches yeah, me yeah. deeply. I was, I, I had, you know, just bringing up bird language was off the cuff. And then to hear that you have that relationship touches me. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps now and people who know nothing about birds probably thinks this is <laughs> what I'm about to say next is ridiculous. I, you know, we, we only have, certain amount of memories that stick in our head because of an emotional connection to them that really sears it. I can't remember the, 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 if it's an implicit or an explicit memory. I can't remember which mm. is which. <laughs> I once found a cuckoo's egg in a robin's nest. Uh-huh. Yeah. I found, a, I found a robin's nest and there was this great big blue egg in it. And I was like, first of all, I was like, who's put this egg in this nest? And then when I realized nobody would ever do that and I started to look it up, I realized that it was a cuckoo. And I learned about cuckoos. They don't build their own nest. They, they lay their yeah. eggs in other people's eggs. And then yeah. the chick is born first. It kicks the other eggs out. And then this poor little robin ends up feeding this big cuckoo. That sticks in my mind as a, as a moment of nature, which just absolutely, I was, what a, a, this is how a cuckoo <laughs> Raise it. it doesn't even raise his kids. It just drops his egg in somebody <laughs> else's nest that says, raise my kid for me. And, uh -huh. and, I, and it sticks in my mind. Yeah. There's and, humans and, like and that I, too, huh? But that, but that memory can get lost in, I've got a family support and I need to make some money mm. to make them feel secure. And then all of a sudden that memory disappears. Like a, another big one for me, is when I was 14, I played the Artful Dodger in a school production of Oliver. So mm. all, all week, I, I learned a freaking script. I learned to sing. I learned to dance. I mm. never put a word wrong. I loved it. The crowd loved me. Everything about it was amazing. Mm. But the next year, when they wanted me to go into a different production, it wasn't sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? So, so now I feel the pull to act. I feel a pull to create. I feel a pull to get back into nature. Um, but I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. There's a real fear there of going down the street and joining an improv class that I'm mm. battling with at the moment. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, life is where our edges are. You know, mm. and um, that's an edge for me too. Improv. Um, mm. It wasn't in middle school. It, it, it has been since middle school that I part that I participated in any improv type stuff. But I always loved it. It was so edgy. It requires um, this this extreme capacity to be in the present moment. Um, that I, that I cherish. And, and we were just teaching out in Vermont. Um, my partner and I were teaching out there and, and, uh, there was some people, we did an embodiment workshop, four days of embodiment, um, radical embodiment, radical ritual movement. Um, and in the evenings we would have different activities. Um, like I did storytelling one night and, uh, and there was a, there was a talent show one night. <laughs> and like three or four people went up there and did improv. Um, and it was so fun and so funny. It was such a good time. It was such a good time, but there's that thing, you know, of maybe that's the edge, which, which brings you into deeper participation. We interrupt this broadcast between Lee Davy and Darren Silver, two tree huggers, to tell you about a book which sounds very ironic, seeing as though you have to cut trees down to make books, but this book is a digital book. 
is called the Stride Method. Control alcohol for 30 days so it doesn't control you for 30 years. Why am I talking in this squeaky voice? I can't do it anymore. I've got COVID, man. Anyway, the book, 30 chapters, 30 concepts handpicked from the Strive Method, okay? Our amazing workshop that helps you stop drinking alcohol and live a self-led life. 30 concepts, all right? Now, this is what RME said in the UK about our book. I've read a fair few quick lit books in my time, but this one really resonated with me. I read the book in its entirety in a day. Lee explains things so simply and something has changed in my whole attitude of drinking in that I know I will never touch a drop again. Probably sounds a little far-fetched that I got to this point from reading a book. Maybe it's a combination of all the recovery work I put in. Maybe it's finally my sober time, but there's no doubt that this little gem of a book helped me cross that line. I now intend to reread one chapter a day and work on the exercise and fully absorb the content. If you're someone who's worried about your alcohol intake or are sober curious, give this book a go. I would highly recommend visiting 1000daysober.com where you'll be able to buy that book. Okay, get stuck in, enjoy it. And if you do buy it, you can also join our book club, which means we will be um, hosting a live event every month talking about a chapter of the book and you will be included. Right, I'm going to shut up and leave you back in the capable hands of Darren Silver. Yeah, and also what I was thinking there was I would be there as an event and I would participate and I would enjoy it. Like, for example, like um, before Zia was born, like five years ago, I went to Burning Man. Mm-hmm. And all the way all the way leading up to Burning Man, I, I, I don't get excited about something until I'm there. Like, much. So my wife's like nagging on me because I'm not excited. I'm, I'm worried. I'm like, I have this like rigid pattern. Like I'm worried about everything. Like, mm. but then I get there and then I'm in my element. I remember it just suddenly, I remember Glastonbury in 94, Reading Festival in 94, the freedom, the ability to naked people just walking down the street, like, like the ability to just express yourself and do and be who you want. Mm. And I revel in that. And then mm-hmm. it ends. And then I come back to Groundhog Day. Like e- even, right. even, even me who feels like I'm living my meaning and purpose, right? Like I, I want to help people live a self-led life after alcohol. And even that, I find, I find it turning into Groundhog Day a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Today I got to do some content, and today I got to tap into people, and then I got to see Darren, and then I got to go for a walk because I can't be me and my computer for ninety minutes. And and I'm learning how can I fully participate in this, which is why I asked you that first question, mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. ticking things off a list. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, that's that's. Uh... That's the riddle. I the mean, riddle. I mean, when I take people out for wilderness rites of passage, you know, the hardest, the hardest, uh, the most difficult and most challenging stage nowadays is the return. Hmm. Um, because it's not quite clear what we're being initiated into. It's not clear, you know, several hundred years ago. And I mean, depending on, on our people and where we come from, you know, it could have been a thousand years ago, could have been 500 years ago, could have been the last generation had clear rites of passage and the, and, and the initiate knew what they were being initiated into. Hmm. And for us, we don't, we don't. Um, and we often have to create the context of which our visions can come through. Meaning we context, meaning like the structure, the culture um, of which what we experience out there can emerge. And it's incredibly challenging. We have to have um, so much more capacity um, to be able to do the emails. So, or whatever it is to be able to do the other part, which is the vision that we really hold. Mm. It's, it's, it's very, very challenging. Uh, another way, I mean, context is like culture. It's like, you know, we have to create the container of which our vision can come through. Whereas for most of our uh, human history, where rites of passage have taken place, we didn't have to create the context. The context was there. The culture was there. 
Um, we don't have that now. And so we're glued to our computer for however long it may be, or have to do this or that or the other thing that is not the juice. I heard Robert Bly say one time, he goes, um, uh, he goes, yeah, the guy who wrote the poem fucking hates having to share it, you know, <laughs> like go to poetry readings. He's like, it's two different kind of humans. And, and sometimes it's that way, you know, it's like, you know, the part of me that likes to guide people in the wilderness, um, you know, can't stand having to, I mean, I love podcasts, can't stand having to do all the emails, you know, mm -hmm. to get, I mean, it's like, it's brutal, uh, but that's okay. That's okay too. You know, um, it's just not really all that fun. And we're going to have to do things and learn to develop that that grit and that determination to get through those things that are not fun or oh, find somebody in your team that could do them for you. You can do it for And man, if I'm doing my job well, then I'm creating a world where we have to be on computers and cell phones obsolete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I'm doing my job well, then, then I'm creating a world where these things are obsolete. Yeah. How, how does two questions for you actually is um, one how, if you're listening, if someone's listening to this and they, they've they lost their sense of self, right? Mm -hmm. they, they they haven't got that. They're not connected to that creative essence, that, that ability to vibrate or respond to or connect with something greater than them, such as nature, right? Um, how, how does one then start to cultivate that? Um, and also, could you touch upon... Uh, the difference between visions and dreams, which you spoke about so eloquently in Illuminated Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two great questions. Um, yeah. Love and rapping with you, Lee. You, you're bringing <laughs> some really good questions. It's really fun. You know, there is, it's almost like a case by case basis. Somebody that's lost connection with themselves. Um, there's just so many ways that we can lose the self in so many ways that we can reclaim. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to speak generally on that. And we, we've spoken about a few, you know, mm -hmm. remember mm -hmm. the aspects of our, of our, our childlike innocence mm -hmm. um, and, and find more play. I mean, that can be, that can be one spending time in nature, of course. Um, Gosh, I mean, there's there's uh, reattuning to the body and finding healthy practices with the body. Mm. Touch, on that, be, touch on that one a little bit more. Yeah. So, I mean, yoga has been a part of my life. It's not as strong um, now as it has been in the past. But um, movement is so powerful, mm. so powerful. Taking care of my body um, is so empowering. Uh, making myself a good hearty meal is so empowering. Um, but the, the, the movement um, that I do is inspired from five rhythms and five rhythms is a practice that Gabriel Roth observed in nature, like observed this arc of these rhythms in the natural world. And so by us going through those five rhythms in two minutes or two hours, um, all of a sudden we, again, here's that word. We are participating in the great movement of life. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's just so many, it's, it's so hard to say. Um, it's so hard to say like one or a few things. Cause it's kind of a case by case basis for me in the way that I work. Um, but here's something really simple and concrete. I'll say oftentimes when we are suffering or we are pulled out of ourselves in some way, it's because we have some sense of an ideal that we are trying to achieve Buddhism. They call it desire, hmm. but I'm saying an ideal and, um, we are suffering, trying to achieve that ideal as opposed to getting a clear view of what is happening now. So there's often a conflict between what we think ought to be and what actually is. 
And if we can be radically honest with ourselves and with the world, with what is, there's usually an opening and freedom of which we can walk into the world. Whether, you know, whatever, whatever the, what's radically honest is, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, as opposed to trying to achieve something other than what we were experiencing or what we want. Mm. Because one of the primary things of, um, right. It's a passage of old, right. Is that, um, we realize the purpose of living is not to get what we want. The purpose of living is not to get what we want. Yeah. What is it then? (laughs) (laughs) Intentionally left blank. It's different for everybody. However, for men specifically, because I do a lot of work with men, it's how, how can we be generative in the world where we are no longer, you know, initiation is being, um, leaving the mother's world, the literal mother's world and going into the great mother's world, meaning the earth, Mm. meaning this world that we live on. And so when we're in the mother's world, we're being taken care of, we're being fed, we're being, you know, suckling on her breast, if you will. And then the time of adolescence is you go out and you have these experiences and all of a sudden you go, now it's time for me to bring life to where I go. And the the incredible state of the world that we're in is a bunch of men that are still taking, Hmm. still taking as opposed, I mean, as opposed to being generative. Yeah. yeah. I, once heard you, I once heard you say men are meant to be generative, not extractive. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so removing that ideal, removing this sense of what ought to be and getting real gritty and really honest with what is. Yeah. Mm. So, so you're talking there about, um, having an expectation of X, Y, and Z, and then being disappointed because you don't reach that expectation and yeah, the vulnerability of just letting it drop. Yeah. That's, um, that's one way to look at it, but um, there are ways that we set that are, that are more pervasive that we set ourselves up Um to, to be in conflict, um, you know, so many ways, so many ways. Um, shame is a good one. Guilt is a good one. It doesn't necessarily involve other people, which expectation kind of sometimes does, mm. you know, like this sense of, man, I, I, I did wrong. I, I ought to have been this way, mm. you know, suffering because there's an ideal, an ideal that I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. I'm suffering. You ought to be different. (laughs) That's Mm. another one, Mm. you know? Um, So what was the second question you asked? I lost it. I'll ask you, I'll ask you in a minute. Cause I, cause you've just brought up some things I want to share with you um, Uh before I move on to the second question on on the, on the ideal thing. There's something that came up for me that I've been practicing lately. I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't raised religious. So there's a real rational, logical kind of, uh, I would say that's my foundation, right? So, mm-hmm. so when you, when you talk about communicating with trees, for example, or I mm-hmm. think about talking to God or being at tune with a higher power, it's, it takes me away from my, it deviates me away from my norm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But recently I've been trying to change that and Mm -hmm. I've been communicating with God and I've been record. Actually, I don't know why, but I've been referring to God as she. Mm -hmm. And I've been asking her to show me the way, asking her to show me signs. So, for example, when it comes to making money, which is a real thing in my life as a man that comes from how I was raised and my responsibilities as a husband and, a, and as a father with 
expectations of what school my daughter needs to go to, what area we want to live in, all that kind of stuff. I've been so fixated in the the systems and the rationality and the logic of making money <clears throat> that recently I've been saying, hey, <laughs> God, um, here's what I would like. Yeah. Can you show me how that's going to happen? Can, mm. can you show me how to get X amount of clients this week? Can you show me how mm. to sell X amount of books? Can you show me how to attract X amount of dollars? Mm. And I've been, I've been really putting faith in trying to let go of the how. Mm. And since I've been doing that, it's been happening. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I can't explain it. It's, it's almost yeah. like I think to myself, fuck, this is really important and I can't teach it. Yet I look at, <laughs> I look at, I look at you and I get in your space and I'm like, this fucking guy can teach it. Mm. Mm. I just wanted to share that with you. Like, you know, and yeah. There's someone else I want to share with you in a minute, but if you have any reflections on that, if you don't just say no and I'll move on to the next thing. But. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. What I hear in your prayer is a question is like guidance. It's not as fixed as an ideal, much like show me the way. Yeah. I don't want know? to be a, I don't want to be a victim. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't want to appear yeah. like um, I don't know how to do this because I know that exists in me. Like mm -hmm. there's a part of me that's like Darren, you know, like the when I saw you um, in Illuminated Man and listened to you, I came off and I, I wrote I wrote on my piece of paper, what a fucking powerful man. <laughs> now, what happens to me then is I'm like, I need to meet this guy so he can fix my life. Right? There's a there's a fucking part of me that just wants everyone to save me. And I'm getting a bit emotional thinking about it. I want people to save me. And my wife recognizes that in me. And it really turns her off. Quite rightly so, right? So mm -hmm. as I'm talking and communicating to God, there's a part of me that's like, don't make this too fucking easy for me. Like, I want to figure this shit out, but I'm not afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Show yeah. me the signs and I'll fucking, uh, and I'll try my best to see them, which, yeah. I, which I think is presence and awareness. Yeah. 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 I hear you, man. It's, I think it's, um, I think men in particular, I, I, for women too, I, I don't want to, but as a man, um, gosh, it's, 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 uh, there is the ideal, right. Um, that we provide. And, and all the social conditioning around that. Um, and yet, uh, and, and, and a lot of it really noble, a lot of it part of our nature to want to do that. Mm. Um, and yet, when a lot of the ways that we have to provide are in contradiction to um, what our nature has fulfilled for thousands of years, which is protecting the place that we lived, truly protecting the families. You know, now there's this conflict for a lot of men that it's like, well, I'm doing the providing part, but in the process, I'm destroying community. In the process, I'm destroying the earth. In the process, I'm dismantling true education. And there is a space in there where there is unconsciously so much hurt. Um, and oftentimes what emerges out of that is like, can you just fucking see the complexity of all of this? God, um, that's, that's, that sounded like one of my rants when I'm in the middle of a fight. Yeah. If you can only understand what's going on in my fucking mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can you see this? Can you see the contradiction that exists in our being? That part, um, you know, I heard it once said that one of the most challenging things of being a father these days, um, if we have just a little thread of, of, of awareness, which you and I both are working towards, that we have to provide what we never got ourselves. That we have to, and that is fucking hard. That is hard 
to provide what we never got ourselves. So if we never got seen, then we have to learn how to see. And something else you said um, that I wrote down because I have a 21 year old son is you wrote, I got to hear fathers are too close to their son's process. And I, and, and I was like, that really hit me. Cause I, do you know you you talk about the death? Like um Krasimir Dabrowski, the Polish psychologist, he calls it positive disintegration. So those of those of you who watch movies like The Matrix, right? It's a good example. So when I stopped drinking at 35, I had my catabasis, right? Like I mm-hmm. my life as I knew it suddenly resembled the ashes like i i was in still water at the bottom of a fucking dark cave and i just realized i was there it's like someone had just woke me up and said lee this is real life and i yeah. i shit myself and then from that moment i positively disintegrated as dabrowski calls it and i started to climb out of the, the thing right mm. I stagnated again for a long while when I stopped drinking and I thought that I uh, my journey had ended. I only now realizing that that is the beginning, like this mm. is the beginning, but I thought it was the end. Like I was like on my soapbox telling everybody, stop drinking, You'll that's all you need to do, solve the world. But I, I look at my son today, <clears throat> beautiful human being. He was fathered by a guy who was pre-catabasis Oh, pre my major catapult, my major kind of like rock bottom moment. And there's a part of me that wants to fix that, Darren. Mm. There's a part of me that sees sees him and hears him sometimes, and I want to, my fix it energy comes out. And in the past, everything that I've tried spectacularly fails because he's a fucking 21-year-old man. <laughs> like mm. he may be, a, he may be like, not a man. We might not think he's a man, but he thinks he's a fucking man. So he don't want to listen to his dad preach. So I've had to really think, how do I, rel- how do I behave and how do I go about teaching this young man? Mm. Because, as you said, I'm too close to him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember, I remember that question. And it was, um, you know, it's a paradox because in some ways, uh, fathers are really distant. Um, and then in some ways too close. Mm-hmm. And the question was something about rites of passage and initiation. And, and, I, and I was like, the father yeah. can't do it. Yeah, it was like, how, how do we replace... How do we replace damaging toxic rites of passage with healthy ones like they used to do in the way, way, way back in it, like in the, the jungle or whatever, like the guy, there is a, there is a regime, everybody, not regime, there's a ritual, everybody knows what it is, <laughs> but now we don't have it. So the question was, what do we do, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was something like that. And and, and, he, and the man was a father and it was like, well, you really got to have community where it's the uncles that, yes. you know, um, <laughs> Uh, so, so it's like the fathers can't do that bit. Um, and then in some ways fathers are really, really far away. I mean, just so far away. Um, speaking of myself, like my dad left every day for work and I had no idea what he was up to. Mm. None. Um, and I didn't sense that what he was doing was inherently dangerous. So there was no like curiosity, like draw in a sense of like a vital way um, that carried a sense of vitality. Um, Whereas, you know, Robert Bly talks a a lot about this, like, you know, prior to even the sixties, like um, that the father and son were dangerously close. (laughs) Dangerously. Um, like, like the son felt the father's power and blessing, you know? Um, and so the paradox is like, yeah, that part exists. 
And when it comes time to really go through the big transformations from childhood to adolescence or adolescence to adulthood, it's like the father can't really, can't really do that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we need community. We need community to do that. It's um, like, uh, Jude, Jude, go and see Darren. <clears throat> Go, go on, go on, a, go on a walk in the wilderness with Darren, and uh, I can see how that could be so beneficial. Oh, yeah. Or, or even like, I mean, even having conversations about these type of things, or ex- mm. doing it myself. Where'd you go, Dad? I just spent five days in the woods with bears and tigers, and this is what I learned, and uh, and uh, it was a really valuable experience for me. Not, <laughs> and you should go, right. <laughs> you know. Right. And, and I think I'm, and I'm thinking I'm getting that part. Okay. Like my feedback from, he just had a 21st birthday party and, uh, and I went to it. Um, I surprised him, you know, cause I was in Latvia actually. And I flew back and, and surprised him and all of his friends came up to me and were hugely respectful of my influence on their lives as his friends. Mm. And I was thinking, how does that happen? And it's the conversations that you're having in the car Mm -hmm. ride to the football match. It's the way that you deal with your son when his friends are around in a Mm -hmm. complicated and difficult issue. And, and that got me thinking that, wow, that, there are other people out there that are influencing my son more than I'm influencing him that I don't even know exist mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and how important being in the right communities in the right environment are because that could easily be toxic. Right. True. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> I had friends, dads growing up that that brought a lot of toxicity in my life. But there's one thing I was thinking, you know, I was, I was having, I was like imagining you, you know, spending five days out in the wilderness to come back and telling your kids, you know, one thing that's been lost in the context of transformation and the context of initiatory experiences, or even rites of passage is a capacity um, to learn through the imaginal and the unknown mm. um, and the mythic. And more than ever, more than ever, at least in the West, we are completely chained to literalism. And there's something, there's a lot that happens out in the wilderness or at our sit spot that is unexplainable. Like your relationship with God that's happening is unexplainable. Mm. You know, the actual etymology of explain is to make flat. To make flat. And so sometimes, like the ability to go through true initiatory experiences or rites of passage, we don't get because we've lost the capacity to really live in the imaginal, live in the unknown, live in the mythic, where, man, it wasn't just a lion out there. You know, it was a part of myself hunting me down. Mm. You know, that I had to look square in the eyes or whatever it may be. You know, I'm just riffing. Mm. And um, that creates a world of which the young people want to step into. Mm. It creates a whole world because, um, because it has the fecundity of the unknown. It has the um, fullness of mystery. And to actually really be in the unknown, it is terrifying. It is really like to really be in the unknown Um, and young people. That's the good kind of trouble. We need to continue to invite them into the good kind of trouble, the good kind of danger um, Mm -hmm. where we have to have faith. You know, when I put people on the mountain for four days and four nights and there, I mean, I have to have faith completely that it is the good kind of trouble. It is the right kind of danger. And if a mountain lion shows up or a pissed off bear that they will be taken care of, you know? Mm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. my, my, my reflection on that, it, that came off of me was less, less nature for me at the moment. Cause I'm not getting out of it in it as much as I should be. Mm but it's these signs. So I'm asking God to show me the signs Mm. 
And then let's say you afterwards recommend that I talk to X. There's something uncomfortable now, me talking to X. It's like, what do I want to talk to this guy about? I'm going to feel like, right? But then I'm like, oh, oh, this Mm. is one of those signs. Mm. It's unknown. Now, some somebody might look at that and go, what are you on about? He's, he's just told you to speak to so-and-so. But now I'm, I'm going into it, the story. I'm like, no, this is a sign. I'm going to follow this. What could this mean? Yeah. And then I make it out and mean something, and then that generates questions, mm. curiosity. And then I meet the guy. I had a conversation last night with a guy called Krish, Krishna. Never met him in my life. And I was mm. like, I'm going to get on the phone with him because somebody said we should connect. And then I was like, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. I'm like, do you know a game designer? Cause I want a game of addiction. It's like, hell yeah. Do you want his number? It's like, yeah. And I was like, thank you, God. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm almost like I'm making a game out of it and it's fun. It's interesting. It's mm-hmm. exciting, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm not poking fun at myself anymore for doing that. Mm-hmm. And because of the rational part of me, the ego part of me is like, Lee, it's just a coincidence. Lee, it's just as it is. And no, I'm like, no, what if it wasn't a coincidence? Mm-hmm. What if it is something that we can't explain? And that makes life a little bit more exciting for me. So yeah. if, it, if it works, why fuck with it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I hear... I hear, um, I mean, what you're saying is this is like you are participating with the world and with God and with life by offering up these questions and offering up these prayers. And the thing is, man, is that I don't think we're often given answers. It's just like the path opens, just like you said, like, um, to connect with this guy and like, what am I doing here? And then all of a sudden it opens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like it. Anyway, we came up to time. I didn't get to answer you, ask you that other question, but um, we'll do. It oh, that's the other question, real quick. Sure? You good? Thirty second good? answer. Okay, yeah. thirty. It was the difference between visions and dreams. Ah, the vision and dreams. Yeah. So, um, the question was asked to me when I was twenty. So, so nearly twenty years ago. Um. And the question was, are you willing to give up your dreams to follow your vision? And that question has come up at so many crossroads, so many junctures in my life. And what I've come to realize is that a dream only has to do with me. Only has to do with Darren. Mm. Whereas a vision is something that um, involves my people. And involves the earth. It's a very different feeling feeling inside my being. Mm. My dream would be to uh, have a cabin in Alaska somewhere. My dream would be to have uh, a house on the beach in Maui. Um, that's not my vision. Yeah, that that's not where where life comes and opens up where I feel like I can really participate. Um, doesn't mean that I, uh, sometime I don't go to Alaska. Doesn't mean I don't go to Maui, you know, and hang out. Um, but more often than not, when I've come to those crossroads, it's brought me deeper into my sense of vision. I have to remain here and continue working with the young people, you know, even though what I want is this, you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's the short answer to dreams and and visions. Well, beautiful place There's, to end. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, bro. Yeah, beautiful place to end. Tell people how they can find you, get older. You obviously, I'll put it in the show notes. But for those of them running around the block right now, um, what are you doing? What are you doing? And what are you offering these days? Yeah, um, I have a website. It's DarrenSilver dot Earth. D A R R E N. S I L V E R dot earth. Um, a lot of wilderness based rites of passage, vision quest type work, 
I do divinations in a West African tradition, um, work with adults, work with men, work with women, work with teens. Mm. You can always find me on um, Instagram as well, ds.silver. And um, yeah, that's where folks can find me. And Lee, I just want to thank you so much, man. Thank you for reaching out and, 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 and also, you know, you impact me with the praise that you've given of how touched you were in um, the Illumina- Illuminated Man uh, mm. conference. And even, more, even more, even more again today. So yeah, uh, yeah keep yeah. doing the good work. I just want to honor you and uh, draw attention to that, that you, you are changing people. These, these things matter. Hmm. you know thank you some someone will listen to this and it will change their life you know so and that's that's no exaggeration it does so thank you for that yeah thanks brother it's honored to be here i hope you enjoyed that folks isn't he a beautiful beautiful presence oh darren silver right if you want to know more about darren or how to work with him email me at the stride method at gmail.com now before you go sorry nearly burped into the microphone before you go If you want to live a self-led life, if you want to be present with your children, if you want to communicate more effectively from a place of self with your wife or your husband, if you want to be a great leader, if you want to take 100% responsibility for yourself, if you want to heal wounds, go into the shadows and understand your childhood and how it's impacted your actions today, then you may consider one-on-one coaching with your truly Lee Davey, okay? In 2021, I went through the Elementum Coaching Institute, which was a six-month training school run by Alexi Panos, Preston Smiles, Stefan Osifandos, and Christine Hasler. Me and 98 other people, or 93, something like that, received hundreds of hours of coaching and gave 100 hours of coaching while learning so much about the way that the body and the mind and the soul operate. I am now graduated as a master coach and I'm here to serve one-to-one coaches in any aspect, in any pursuit, whether it's poker, football, basketball, pickleball, picking your nose, or becoming someone that doesn't drink alcohol and living a self-led life, is going to take you further quicker than any other form of training or coaching available. So email me at thestrivemethod at gmail.com and book a choose yourself call with me to learn more about one-to-one coaching with myself, okay? With much love, take care of yourself and don't forget, go to your podcast player and rate and review the show. Love you all. Take care, bye.